Thank you for joining with me today. We're going to be looking today at part two of our series on called The Invisible Foe. Uh, the origin today is the origin of Satan. The series is about Satan and his angels. Our scripture today is we're going to start with 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 from the Legacy Standard Bible. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world hears them. We are from God. The one who knows God hears us, and the one who is not from God does not hear us. From this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Let's pray. We look into the word today, Father, and we trust that your Holy Spirit will be our teacher. Please guide us in understanding. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I decided to start out this message in which we will look at the origins of the devil with this passage in 1 John chapter 4 for one basic reason. It reminds us that while Satan is in this world and that he is a powerful and he is able to draw people to follow him, he is not all powerful. And more than that, the one who is in us, the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, the one who is in us is greater, far, far greater than our unseen foe, the devil. This opening passage talks about the fact that there are false prophets in the world today. And they have that spirit of the Antichrist. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that while they themselves are not the true Antichrist who is to come, they have the same self-seeking, self-glorifying, self-aggrandizing goals as that coming man of sin. Because they, like him, are led by the devil. Generally, they probably don't recognize that. They, they're not necessarily overt worshipers of the devil, but it is nonetheless true. They lead people away from following God to follow after themselves. They have the spirit of Antichrist. And that is a spirit that comes from Satan. Now, Satan can be a pretty scary guy. And it makes some people nervous to even hear anything about him, worrying about what he might do. But if you belong to Jesus Christ, if you are trusting in him for your salvation, if you have received him as your savior and you recognize that he's died for your sins on that cross and he rose in victory over the, the grave, you have nothing to fear about in learning about your enemy, the devil. In verse 4 of the scripture passage we started off with, John reminds us of something. He says, you are of God, little children, that's us, and have overcome them. Why? How do we overcome false prophets? How do we overcome the evil one? Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. God, who is in us, is greater than Satan, and it isn't even close. The distance in the level of power and, and authority between God and Satan is not even measurable for us. It is so great. So as we learn about our enemy, real, recognize that there's nothing to fear. He is a defeated foe. Now that said, there's a lot for us to gain in learning about him. Know your enemy. Know your enemy. He is conquered, yes. And he will be punished for all his transgressions? Yes. But, but, but those things have not yet been fulfilled. And God, for his own reasons, has allowed the devil to still exercise a strong and malevolent 
presence on the earth. Satan is intense and he's vicious and he's filled with ill will and spite and hatred. And yet all of that is clothed by his deceptive deception. He found out a long time ago, it's easier to draw people away from God by going about his plans quietly and methodically. And so even for God's victorious people, it's good for us to know the enemy well. After the 1996 NFL season came to an end, the Buffalo Bills starting quarterback, Jim Kelly, retired. The Bills had a young guy named Todd Collins to vie for the starting job the next year. But they also brought in another player, a fellow named Billy Joe Hobart. Maybe some of you remember him. Hobart made the team behind Collins as a second string quarterback. In mid-October, in one of the games, Collins got hurt. And so Hobart came in. And he was awful. After the game, he admitted that he wasn't really ready to play. I mean, physically he was fine, but he shared with reporters that he hadn't really studied that week's playbook. Oh, he had glanced at it, he said, but he didn't know the strengths and the weaknesses of the opponent the way that he should have known them. Three days later, the Bills cut him from the team. Hobart had committed a huge error. He had not studied his opponent. He did not know their tendencies. He did not, I, I, I don't know, what did he think he was being paid for? He knew that he was always only one play away from being in the game and that injuries happen all the time. And he failed to be ready. And that failure did him in. With that in mind, my friends, are you ready to take on your opponent? Did you know that your enemy, the devil, has certain tendencies? Do you know what they are? Don't just glance at what your playbook, the Holy Bible, says about your foe. Know it. The more you comprehend, the safer you will be from the devil's tactics. And we're going to look at them in this series. The first order of business is to understand where the devil came from. Some people think that Satan has been around forever, just like God. Some false religions, like the Mormons, teach that Jesus and Satan are actually brothers. These are false notions. Jesus, you see, is not a created being, but the devil was created. That said, we need to understand that he, Satan, has been around a lot longer than mankind. In the book of Job, there is uh, recorded a conversation between God and Job. And, and our Lord brings up the creation of the world. Now, notice what he says to Job about this, because this begins something that's really instructive about the devil. And so God says to Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fashioned? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? When God made the earth, we're told here by him that the morning stars sang together. The morning stars. Now understand that these are not real stars. How do we know that? Well, the stars themselves uh, are, were, were part of creation, stars that you can look at up, up in space. They were part of creation rather than, than witnesses to it. According to Genesis uh, verse chapter 1, verses 14 through 19, it wasn't until day four that the stars were created by God. They, they were created after the world was created. And so the morning stars who shouted for joy on, at the time of creation when the world was made, they had to be something other than actual stars. Now, in the same passage, uh, the, 
uh, in Job, they are also called sons of God. Sons of God. Let me let me bring that up for us. The verse seven, when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God all shouted for joy. Now, this phrase, sons of God, is reserved in the scriptures for creatures who were born as du a direct act of God. OK, Adam was a son of God because he was directly created by the Lord. Eve falls into this category, too. She would be a daughter of God, of course. But after all that, uh, but after all that, children who are born have not been crea created directly by God. This includes each one of us. And we, we are the product of procreation between a man and a woman. And Genesis chapter 6 points this out. Now watch this, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. It says, now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. Okay, so well after Adam and Eve, the earth is getting full and daughters were born to them. Verse 2, that the sons of God, the angels, saw the daughters of who? Men. That they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves all of whom though they chose. So, so what do we see here? First, we see we're introduced to the angels, the sons of God. And we find out later that these, by the way, are actually fallen angels known to us by another name, demons. What are they doing? Well, that we're, they're seen as actually cohabitating with women. Notice again that these women are not called daughters of God, but they're called daughters of men because they are not directly created by God. But all the angels were created by God, probably all at the same time. And, and it was before the world was created. And by the way, those fallen angels who, who, who cohabitated women, they got in big trouble over this act of taking human women and committing sexual acts with them and actually having children. And we'll talk about that in one of our in our one of our future um, sermons on this 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 topic, but they got in good big trouble, and these angels who had relations with women were severely punished. And even today, even today, they're under that same punishment, and they will never get out of their miserable prison until the final day of judgment. Jude tells us this. It says, "And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, in other words, they didn't stay as angels." But they or, or act as angels, but instead they came into women, but left their own abode. He has reserved an everlasting change. They're never going to get out under the darkness for the judgment of that great day. You see, these demons were the worst of the worst, and they were put away by God. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves right now. The bottom line is that these sons of God were angels, and they were with God at the time the world was created. And Satan was one of them. But Satan was not just any angel, you see. Yeah, he was the highest of them all. The highest of them all. Now, there are different kinds of angels listed in the Bible. Jesus spoke, I'm going to, I'm going to run past some things and I'm going to put some scriptures up for you and, and you'll have to look in your notes uh, later on to, to, to catch up with them because I'm not going to read them. I'm just going to put them up. But, but there were a number of different kinds. Jesus spoke of guardian angels, first of all, um, for children in Matthew 18, 10, he said, their angels always seek, see my father's face who is in heaven. Then the writer of Psalm 91 indicates as well that, that there may have been uh, adults who have guardian angels as well. He shall give his angels charge over you. That's for people who are fearing the Lord. There's another angelic class known as seraphim, seraphim. And these are angels that guard God's glory. And Isaiah the prophet saw them, and he wrote about them in Isaiah 6 and spoke of them. And, and um, there's yet another class of angels. Gabriel, remember him, the one who talked to Mary? He was a messenger angel. Now, we don't know if the angelic, uh, if that's an angelic category by itself or not, but it might be. Another angelic class was the, was the one that Michael was in. Michael was an archangel. Now, Archangels is a class of great warrior angels. I don't know if this was the very highest class or not, but they're very powerful. 
And we find out that Michael was the chief protector of the Jewish people in Daniel 12, 1, and that he is an archangel. In the, we find that out from the book of Jude, verse 9. Now, there's, there's one other class of angels that we know of, and they are the cherubim. Cherubim are apparently the highest class of angels, and it's very possible that archangels are also cherubim. Now, we don't really know. But there was one particular cherub who was at the top of them all. And I will introduce what God says about him from the passage in Ezekiel. Now, I want you to stay with me here because we need to lay some groundwork, okay? Before we actually get to see where, where the devil came from, we got to learn uh, do a little groundwork. So with me, I hope you're with me in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 1 and 2. And it says, the word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am a God, I sit in the seed of gods in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man and not a God, though you set your heart as the heart of a God. Now, this chapter opens with a prophecy against an evil king, the king of Tyre. And he was a wicked and proud man. And this prophecy against him actually goes on for 10 verses. The Lord reveals what will happen to this king who proudly considered himself some kind of God. We pick it up in, in verse uh, verse 8 and or verse 6 and go down through verse 8. It says, therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have set your heart uh, as the heart of a God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against your beauty, the beauty of your wisdom, and defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into the pit, and you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. Now, clearly, the Lord promised an in inglorious end to this depraved tyrant. Now, the prophecy against him continues. But in verse 11, it takes a turn. In what way? Well, Ezekiel's prophecy begins to look at the power behind the king. And, and that power, that evil, was something that was perpetrated by one of the original sons of God, one of the original angels. That's right. Now, look. Look with me at verse 11, and we'll read it, and we'll see, okay? Verse 11, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God. Now, here we go. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub. Remember them? Cherubs, the highest angels. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Now notice how this starts in verse 12. Thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Three things. The seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Now does, does that still sound like uh, God is talking to the, about the king of Tyre. It does not. That king never had God's seal of perfection. Far from it. And the king of Tyre was never known for his beauty either that we know. You see, at this point, God is looking behind him, beyond him. To the invisible power that, that had motivated this king to be such a wicked ruler. This is where we first learn about the origins of the one that we know as Satan or the devil. Now, the devil originally had a heavenly name, one that we've all heard before, 
but we don't find it in this passage. We need to look at a companion passage written by the prophet Isaiah. And, and, and as we look at this, there's a, there's a bit of symmetry that I want you to get between what Ezekiel wrote and what Isaiah wrote. How so? Well, we just saw that Ezekiel started out writing about an earthly king, the king of Tyre, and he ended up speaking of Satan. He was showing us the power behind the king. Well, likewise, in Isaiah's writing, he too began telling us about an earthly king. In his prophecy, it was of the king of Babylon. But like uh, Ezekiel, he ended up telling us about the power behind that king. And it's the same power that Ezekiel spoke about. Look with me at it. Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14. Isaiah writes the words of God, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Now notice in verse 12, the name of this one who is the power behind the, the, uh, the, the throne of King of Babylon. He was one known as Lucifer. And by the way, that word Lucifer in Hebrew literally means day star, day star. You remember what we saw in Job earlier? When the morning stars sang together, all the sons of God shouted for joy. Lucifer was one of those stars. He was the day star, one of the angels. He was the one we now know as Satan. He no longer has that exalted name, Lucifer. So what happened to him? How did the devil, Lucifer, who was directly created by God, become Satan? How did he become the devil? Did, did God create him to, to be evil? Certainly not. I want you to understand something about angels. All angels, uh, this, this is true of, okay? God gave his angels, all the aspects of personhood, personhood. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a person? Well, there are several different things that define personhood. First, a person has moral accountability, moral accountability. Now, this, this is different from than all the other creatures in the animal kingdom. Animals are not morally accountable for their actions. They are not, the, I mean, they are the way they are because that's the way God made them. If you get scratched by a cat, it's not a moral issue, okay? The cat is not being wicked. Cats just being a cat. That's what they do. When an alligator catches prey, be it a fish in the water or a small dog walking too close to the edge of the pond, it's sad, yes. But likewise, it's not a moral issue. The alligator is acting the way God pre-programmed it to behave. But persons, be they angels or human beings, have the ability to reason and to make choices and to make plans and to communicate those plans to others, including to God. Moral accountability, the ability to reason, the ability to plan, the ability to communicate, these are all aspects of personhood. The angel, Lucifer, like all angels, had these characteristics. That's the way he was created in heaven. Perhaps the most important aspect of personhood is the ability to make moral decisions. Lucifer had that ability, and he used his moral decision-making powers to sin, to choose sin. He used his abilities not to serve God, but to try to aggrandize himself. Look what Ezekiel tells us uh, in chapter 28. In, his, in verse 12, uh, in the second part, it says, Thus says the, God, the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. 
I want you to notice something right off. This angel known in heaven as Lucifer was the, it says, the seal of perfection. He was perfect in beauty. Now, we don't know what Lucifer looked like, but before he fell, he was the epitome of what God said was perfect when it came to beauty. I mean, he was the supermodel among supermodels. And by the way, as you as you as you contemplate that, compare that to the caricatures that people assign to him today with horns on his head and pointy ears and deep red skin and maybe some warts and a tail and, and other things that would definitely not qualify the devil as being handsome. That's the way he's characterized today. The one who started out the most beautiful, perfect in beauty. When Satan decided to rebel, he lost everything. And we'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. But don't misunderstand what I'm saying. <laughs> he fell, yes. He lost a lot, yes. But he has power now. But he's a shell of what he once was. Now look with me, moving on a little bit into there, to verse 13. It says, it says you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper. Sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The, this angel, Lucifer, was in Eden, we read here. Now, I believe this is talking about the heavenly Eden, not the earthly Eden. Now, we know he fell and he ended up there, but I think this is before that. Apparently, the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve lived, was, was based on a heavenly version. You see all those precious stones that are mentioned? When the Apostle John tells us uh, in the book of Revelation, Revelation 21, about what heaven is like, he names no less than eight of these same precious stones. They are in heaven. And Lucifer lived in heaven with God. He was the highest angel of heaven. All of, God's, of all of God's created beings, Lucifer was number one. And not only was he the most beautiful of all God's create the creatures, but he apparently was even the music director, the music director in heaven. We're told that at the end of verse 13. Take a look at it. It says, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Now, the timbrel was a type of tambourine made to be played with joy and exultation and triumph. It was an instrument with happiness just about virtually flowing out of it. Lucifer was endowed by God at his creation with every attribute to be the most amazing musician. The idea here may well be that Lucifer, get this, was the worship leader of music in heaven. He may have led the choir of angels. It seems possible and even probable that he was the composer of and writer of music that was for the sole purpose of worshiping God. Maybe he was also uh, the one with the most powerful and beautiful voice. That wouldn't surprise me. Going back to the book of Job, where we've looked at a couple times, he may have been the one who actually penned the words and the music of that time when it says, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God, all the angels shouted for joy. Wouldn't that be something if Satan or Lucifer was the one who actually penned those words, those songs? Notice another thing. Part of the preparation given to him on the day that he was created uh, were the pipes. You see that in the scriptures? The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you. In verse 14, we read, the Hebrew word for pipes is nekeb. It literally speaks of an indentation or a hole that is drilled. It was a, it's actually a jewelry term. And it likely spoke of the, the place where a jeweler would fasten gems into a beautiful work of art on clothing. And again, it all points to the beauty and to Lucifer's exalted place among the angels in heaven. He had it all. And Ezekiel sums this up for us in verse 14. He says, you were the anointed cherub covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked 
back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. Lucifer was the anointed cherub, it tells us, who covers. The, the allusion here is probably to something that was very familiar to the Jews of Ezekiel's day. They probably understood this uh, very well. You see, the, the, the temp, in the temple of the Jews, which, which God had instructed Moses to build, and it, he, Moses built it as a tabernacle in the wilderness to begin with. And later on, King Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem with, with this. But God commanded that, that two images of cherubim, of these mighty angels, were to be fashioned to hover over the mercy seat inside the Holy of Holies. Okay, And, 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 and likewise, Lu when Lucifer was called the angel who covers, uh, it may have spoken of the closeness that Lucifer had at one time had to the throne of God, to the place of the Lord's, um, to the Lord's um, presence. How close would he have been? We're told in the scriptures that of him, you walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. He walked back and forth in the midst of, of the fiery stones. Now, what does this mean? What is this about? Well, we just saw that Lucifer wore ju jewels, right? It, but it, it wasn't just part of his wardrobe, but it was actually part of who he was. God made him that way. And, he, and, and as he walked, all that jewelry may have shimmered as if it was on fire. The image reminds me of something, I know this is going to sound silly, but it reminds me of someone like Elvis stalking around on the stage in some of his most outrageous outfits. I mean, maybe Lucifer was the original rhinestone cowboy. I don't know, but um, it was all good for Lucifer at that time. Till we get to verse 15. Look at verse 15. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Iniquity, sin, was found in Lucifer. So what happened? What, what sin did he commit? How did this angel, who had literally everything a person could ever want, how could he see it all evaporate? and get his sorry butt kicked out of God's heaven forever. Lord willing, next week, we will see how. Let's pray. Father, as we look into the word today, we learned a little bit. I pray, Father, that this would help set the table for each one of us to understand the power of the evil one, and also, Lord, help us to be ready, to get ready, to oppose him in every way. Lord, help us not to be like a football player who ignores the fact that, that he could be in an, on any play. Lord, help us to be ready to fight the evil one in this wicked world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.